we have this this conversation a lot, and, and there are some people that I, I guess just don't listen or, or want to believe. Even people that like are in our business that have platforms that just refuse to believe that this is always how college sports has been. But I, I would play it for you. Th- there's some language that that I I can't edit out on the fly, so I'll just kind of tell you what is said. Antonio Cromartie, who, by the way, I believe is the defensive backs coach now at Texas A&M. I believe. I think. Glad he's got work. He's got 25. Um, I, I was going to say, you you think there's like a, a tuition discount if you're employed by a university? Uh, he yes, he is. I was right. Uh, so he's the current uh, cornerback coach for Texas A&M, according to Wikipedia anyway. Uh, he was on a podcast where – they were asking him about recruiting and he talked about his recruitment and he, he liked Ron Zook a lot. Great recruiter. Couldn't coach worth anything, but he really liked Ron Zook and was talking about his recruiting process. No lies. And one of the hosts said, all right, so what kind of NIL deal did you get? Who gave you the biggest one back in the day? And he laughed and said, I'm not going to throw anybody under the bus because I don't want to do that. But I got paid to go on a visit. He said, this school knew I wasn't going to this school, but they paid me to come in and help because my name carried weight with other recruits, and they gave me $60,000 to do it. Hmm. And so the, the more these kind of things get normalized, the more I hope people realize when you say things like NIL is ruining college sports, it has always we weren't lying when we said it's always been this way. It's a current college coach admitting this, by the way. Well, nothing could happen to him, but it has always been this way. Is it being done a little bit different? Sure. But we're talking about a guy who got paid to go on a visit to a school that admitted, we know you're not coming here, but we know you carry weight, so come here, hang out, have some fun, we'll pay you, and hope that spills over into other recruits liking us. It's a long time ago when Antonio Cromartie played college football. At Florida State, by the way. Yeah. I had a I had a really interesting conversation today with someone in the football world. And we were talking about Dabo's comments from earlier this week. You got Nick Saban's comments. Don't know if you've seen these. It's being looked at a little bit differently when Nick Saban says it than, than Dabo Swinney saying it. I don't think what we're doing right now with NIL is a sustainable model. He goes on to say, the concept of name, image, and likeness was for players to be able to use their name, image, and likeness to create opportunities for themselves. That's what it was. But that creates a situation where you can basically buy players. You can do it in recruiting. I mean, if that's what we wanted college football to be, I I don't know. And you can also get players to transfer in the portal to see if they can get more someplace else than they can get at your place. The immediate reaction. Well, they're cheating at Alabama. Of course they are. Of course they are. Well, they're cheating at Texas A&M. They're, you know, Clemson, you know, it's disingenuous because Dabo. All of those things are true. But I think there can also be truth in what these coaches are saying, whether it's Kirby and Nick right before the national championship game or it's Dabo Sweeney or Mike Leach made some comments Uh, unsustainable is a a word that he used. I think college football is hanging in a little bit of a precarious spot. And I'm not sure that I've, I've recently been at this point, but I do think I'm getting there. Are we going to have football by non-NFL players? Is is there going to be football that, that is slotted between what you watch on Friday nights in high school and what you watch on Sundays in the NFL? Absolutely. 100%. 
I don't know that it's going to look like the college football that so very many of us really love right now. Person that I was talking to today goes, you know, I don't know what exactly it's going to look like, but but think about this right now. So, NIL, we're all on board, right? Yes, players should be able to profit. College football is generating ridiculous amounts of money. Players should share in that. How do you keep it as amateur college football? Because we're trending towards semi-pro football at the highest levels. And maybe that's okay, right? Maybe, Maybe it's just times are changing and that's the direction that we're headed and there's some natural delineation in the college football Division I ranks where most of the Power Five, not all of the Power Five, but most of the current Power Five slides into kind of like a Super League semi-pro deal. And then all of the other schools that are not in that group, whether it's because of resources or academic priorities or stadium size or whatever, they slide into what has traditionally been the amateur college football model. But as the money continues to grow, I don't think we're going to be able to go backwards in terms of player compensation. And the focus on, I mean, Don't you think a lot of people, when they heard Dabo Sweeney talk about the importance of getting a degree, just rolled their eyes? Yeah. I think they're, you know. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We, we We didn't come to college to play school. Or whatever the quote was from Cardale Jones along the way. That's a little troubling because not many college football players make it to the NFL. When is the last time major college football has been about academics? When, when have major college football players chosen a school because of academics? Oh, I mean, it's always a really small number of players that do that. That's the thing. And so I, I guess people... Because this Cromartie story, it's not unique. And, you know, maybe there's more money now, but it's always been like this. Kids have always chosen schools because of money or football or or things that were not directly tied to academics. What, What I don't understand is it doesn't look the same. What doesn't look the same? Did you really sit up in the stands at Davis Wade and when a guy caught a touchdown pass, you thought, you know what's great about that? He's not getting paid a dime. This is awesome. Or was it because he's wearing the name and colors of the school that you love while he's catching that touchdown pass? Is it about them not getting paid, or is it about them representing your institution? What attracts you to that game more? Because in terms of level of play, you know, maybe some people disagree with this. I've been to NFL games. You're telling me because they get paid, the game is worse? Or the or they don't try as hard? Because I've seen a lot of college football no, no, teams no, no, quit. No, not at all. No, not at all. But, I mean, the model professionally versus college is, is different. It is. Absolutely. If We're trending toward, like it or not, we're trending toward college football players becoming employees. That would be a – somebody smart needs to prevent that. Because that would wreck college sports. Well, it's it, we're, that's the direction we're headed. Then don't teach your daughters volleyball because there will be no more scholarships for them. I, I don't know if I agree with that. I mean, but we'll, we'll continue this conversation after the quote. Kind of like radio. How many times has radio's death been predicted? And it's stronger than ever. The rumors of my demise have been greatly exaggerated. Talk radio, anyway. Stronger than ever. Yeah, you're exactly right. You know, satellite radio is going to kill it, and podcasts are going to get it. And it just keeps not dying. 
Well, college football is kind of like that. College football is a bit of a cockroach. There are lots of people that have predicted college football's death as changes have happened along the way. And guess what? It just keeps not dying. And it's not going to die. And I'm not going to be the one that says name, image, likeness, and transfer portal are going to kill college football. But college football is changing. And I'm not 100% sure that we are going to recognize college football as it exists today in a few years. A couple of conversations that, that I've had separate in the last week and a half. A highly, highly, highly sought-after recruit from the state of Alabama was at Auburn for their spring game. You get a kid like that on the Auburn campus, Auburn's got a chance, right? We've watched it for years and years and years. Person who knows what they're talking about, said, got no shot. What do you mean, got no shot? Can't afford it. What do you mean you can't afford? No. There are three teams in the SEC that are playing the NIL game at a different level than everybody else. Texas A&M, Georgia, Alabama. Now, does that mean there aren't players out there for all the other schools? Of course not. Of course not. But if it's that isolated to three schools, how can that be good for college football? How can it be good for the Southeastern Conference? How can that be good for Mississippi State and Ole Miss if Auburn looks at a player? The Auburn Tigers look at a player and go, kids in our backyard, we got no shot. Why? Can't afford him. If Auburn can't, what's that mean for everybody else? The next question is, then who can? Alabama, Georgia, Texas A&M. That's it. Those programs tend to get all the players they want anyway, right? I mean, A&M's a little bit different, but, I mean, even Kevin Sumlin was recruiting excellent classes there. It's not like they've... Wait till Texas shows up, by the way. Texas will be the fourth. They're still going to suck, but that's a conversation oh, for a suck, different day. they'll but they'll have players. And I, I could be way wrong about this. Uh, I do think that a market correction will come because, to your point, there's like three schools that will be able to continue this on an annual basis. I, I mean, even – there's a finite amount of money out there that can be allocated towards football players. And I'm not 100% sure that Alabama's playing it exactly the way that Georgia and Texas A&M are playing. See, say, I, I think they've caught up a bit. Saban's quotes did not strike me as a warning as it did others. I don't think this was the spread offense thing. I think this was genuine worry that he can't keep up. And by he, I mean Alabama boosters and alumni. Now, they're very wealthy. They are. They got a lot of them. But I I can't help but wonder if he looks at what Kirby Smart's able to do at Georgia. What Jimbo Fisher is able to do at Texas A&M and think. What Sark will be able to do at Texas. What Sarkeesian will be able to do at Texas and think, I can't do that. I can do a lot, but we can't do that. And look at how Alabama's recruited for the last decade plus. Number one classes every year. NIL comes and Alabama doesn't have the number one class anymore. It used to be Nick Saban on an annual basis signing the greatest recruiting class of all time. Now it's Jimbo. See, it didn't strike me as a warning. It struck me as, wait. We're actually not first at something. And, you know, the crazy thing is Portal and NIL are, are tied together now. Like, it, it, it's it's two different things, but because of the, the ability to move without penalty through the transfer portal and the N, and NIL coming on board at the same time, they're, they're inextricably linked. And so, separate conversation. Guy says, so... Who's the best player coming back for Ole Miss? And it doesn't matter what the name is. Let's just say it's John Smith, right? It doesn't matter who you think the best returning player is. Let's say that that player is getting a certain amount of money in NIL. But there is a recruit 
who is coming in that has promised a larger amount in NIL. So the best returning player has already proven it on the field. But he sees a kid that has never taken a snap in college getting more than he's getting. Never mind locker room tension. I mean, I've kind of like dismissed the whole locker room tension thing since the beginning. Hey, that'll work itself out. I mean, in every facet of life, people make different amounts of money, and you figure out a way to get along. But there is a remedy, right? So, so John Smith, who's getting less in NIL money than the incoming guy who's done nothing, what can John Smith do? Well, he can put his name, his happy little name in the transfer portal. And then one of two things can happen. He can go get NIL money somewhere else. And by the way, this applies to anybody. We're just using Ole Miss as an example. Or he can be re-recruited by his current team with the promise of more NIL money so that he can stay and play. He's got leverage. I'm trying to remember who I, I heard say this. You've got the best of both worlds right now for college athletes in terms of the professional model and the collegiate model, but without any of the constraints that exist in the professional model that protect teams. Right, so, so professional model, a team gets to pick its players, and then it pays them exorbitant amounts of money. And if they're not good, you're cut. Go away, we're not paying you anymore outside what we've guaranteed you. And if you're good, but we need somebody else to help us more than we think you're helping us, we can trade you, and we can send you wherever you want. That doesn't happen in college, right? No. There's also nothing nothing in college – holding a player in place. Whereas if you are on an NFL team and you've got a three-year contract, you can't just leave and go play for another team unless your current team says, yeah, you can do that by cutting you or trading you. You have to play out your contract. And so this was the most fascinating example. And I'd love to tell you who I was talking about, but the conversation was kind of in confidence, and and I don't want to do that. He, He used the example, what if when Sean Payton had stepped down, Gail Benson had said, you know what, I don't want us to take a step back as an organization. And so she walks or flies on her private jet to New England, and she sits down with Bill Belichick and says, Bill, The Patriots are currently paying you $10 million. I will pay you $15 million. Come be my coach, and please bring your 10 best players. And Bill Belichick says, that's a deal, Miss Benson. And Bill Belichick is now the head coach of the New Orleans Saints, and he brings his 10 best players. You can't do that in the NFL. Right? Right. I mean, unless you just so happen uh, to have a bunch the, of expiring contracts and free agency, yeah, but no, that can't happen. Uh, I mean, unless there's compensation, a coach cannot pick up, leave the team under which he is contracted to coach, go to another team, and oh, by the way, just bring his players along with him. It just happened in college football. Yeah. Lincoln Riley left one job, took another job, paying him a whole lot more money, and brought his best players with him with no penalty whatsoever. You know what could have stopped this? We got a message saying that this needs to be regulated. Uh, You know, if the NCAA actually wanted to be competent, what they would do is take their millions and millions and millions of dollars and actively enforce the inducement side of this. That, that's what they would do, and they could actually try to curb some of it. Instead, they have no power, no nothing, and so you can use it as inducements, which is against the rules and laws in most states. But they choose not to. It's their fault. Trade Park, plenty of baseball, soccer, and fast pitch action happening this weekend, and next weekend, and the weekend after that. One weekend after another at M-Trade Park. So if you were a coach or a parent, 
You can check out the full schedule of events at mtradepark.com. 14 fields, uh, fields with full synthetic turf infields, natural grass outfields. That means even when the weather doesn't fully cooperate, the games can go on. Best soccer surfaces in the state of Mississippi, bar none. You need to check it out. If you've not been to M Trade Park in Oxford, make that part of your tournament schedule plans this spring and summer. MTradepark.com. Ceasefire text line. A couple of, uh, actually, let's hold off on that just for a second. So, Borky, these different talks I was having, you know, things came up, about, you know, what, what, what do you do? It, it feels like there's got to be a window in which the transfer portal can operate. Like, it can't just be a, it's open and open and open and open. No, because you've got, you know, tampering has always gone on forever, which is another thing that's always happened, by the way, guys. Tampering has always happened. Sure. But when you've got it going on but, during seasons. But not seasons, to the same level that it's happening right now. Right. And players hitting the portal during seasons, th- that is a bridge too far. Close it during the season. Have a couple windows where it's open to get in, get out, whatever, and operate that way. I don't feel bad for the multi-million dollar football coaches, but the ones that get hurt the most by having to constantly recruit are not the multi-million dollar football coaches. It's the guys making 40 k that's running recruiting tape 12, 13, 14, 15 hours a day working in the facility while the coach is in the Bahamas. Those are the guys that get hurt the most by this. Yeah. We were just kind of spitballing some different ideas, and uh, somebody said, you know one way you could slow this whole thing down? Put non-compete clauses in coaches' contracts. Now, employment lawyers will tell you that non-compete clauses are very, very difficult to actually enforce. But good lawyers can write good clauses also that make them less difficult to enforce. My guess is a Jimmy Sexton client won't be signing a contract anytime soon that has a non-compete clause in it, but think about it. If a coach couldn't leave until his contract expired, or if he did leave before his contract expired on his own, he couldn't coach elsewhere? Hmm. That slows this carousel thing down a little bit. Slows it down a lot. But you know what else it would change? The every time you have a good season, you get a new contract. The automatic rollover. The extension where you bid against yourself. Because coaches wouldn't sign them. Like, look, I got a three-year deal. I got a four-year deal. I may want to test the market at the end of the contract doesn't happen in the NFL, does it? What do we see in the NFL? Shorter contracts. I mean, Kingsbury's contract is like up or was before he got his extension. Yeah. Coach through the end of the contract, then we'll do a new deal. We'll do a new deal based on how successful you were on this last deal. You want to leave at that point? Okay, you can. We decide we want to go get a new coach at that point? Okay, we can. But everything is not then dictated on the constant movement of coaches and worrying if a coach is going to leave and he's going to take players with you. Now, again, I don't think there's any coach out there that would agree to this. But it is fascinating to think about it. Well, exactly. And And, 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 and just the last point here, the fact that coaches' salaries are as big as they are has taken college football collectively's ability away to say we can't afford to pay players. You could say, eh, I mean, you know, he's making a million two. Can't really afford to pay all of the players. You can't say that when he's making nine. Yeah. Or seven. Or five and a half. Or 11. Or, you know, whatever the number is. Yeah, when Ole Miss, uh, who is around top 25 number in academic bu- or athletic budget, can afford seven and a half million, that argument can fall on deaf ears. I mean, Matt Mm -hmm. Luke was making a million bucks to coach the offensive line at Georgia. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. The thing about the NFL, and people don't want college sports professionalized, I get it, I do. It doesn't change anything for me because, again, 
d- does it really change when when your favorite player catches a touchdown pass if you know he isn't making any money? Does that really make you happier? Whatever. The NFL, though, has rules, very specific, detailed rules. When they are broken, you are punished. Guaranteed. Guaranteed. Mm -hmm. If you start the season above the salary cap, you are punished. If you – Dan Snyder is going to lose his team and possibly go to jail. But they have rules that are enforced. That's where I think the biggest failure is. We have somebody on the text line who I agree with completely. This is all the NCAA's fault. You could have had NIL that felt differently than this. Now, were there always going to be recruiting inducements? Sure. But if you really wanted to do your job correctly, you could have tried to enforce it and deter some people. I mean, there's statistics, right? Criminally, but in neighborhoods where there are more police cars seen, crime goes down. It doesn't eliminate crime, but where there are police officers more visible in those areas, fewer crimes happen. So if the NCAA was visible, if they were actually doing their job, if there were an abundance of them and they were seen, less crime would happen. It would still happen, but less of it would. And instead of, I mean... Washington State just straight up bragged that they got their quarterback because of an NIL inducement today. Just, yeah, yeah, we did. That's why he came here, 25K. We got our quarterback. Just out in the open. That should be met with multiple NCAA investigators and punishment in short order if they wanted to do it right. But they refuse. All of their millions of dollars, and they refuse to do it. They're not going to push back on NIL stuff because they know they're going to get slapped down by the Supreme Court if they do. I'm talking just inducements. They can enforce that. I mean, it's state law here. Yeah. If you promised a player money before he signed, and if there's any sign, any sign that that happened, you're punished immediately, like they do in the NFL. Roger Goodell doesn't need to find anything criminal in Deshaun Watson, and he can punish him. Right. Yep. Uh, and, and yet, we're saying the NCAA should enforce this, and yet the NCAA, when they've got federal wiretaps and ample investigation, takes six years to punish LSU. It's an embarrassment. And they've got millions of dollars to play with, and they don't use it. No. And meanwhile, hey, that saying, just give me my football. It's just, I don't all care I'm about saying. any of this other stuff. Just give me all my college football. That's all I'm saying. Somebody says if we're going to turn this into a minor league, minor league, the NFL, then put cap limits on schools. I mean, I don't think that's entirely impossible, though, right? If we trend in the direction of college football players becoming employees, then all of a sudden collective bargaining will be introduced and you'll have caps and you'll have rules and you'll have penalties for breaking rules and you'll have limitations on who can go where. And I mean, it's going to be complicated. And, oh, by the way, if you start playing payers a salary, then the whole tuition, room, and board thing may go out the door, and you may start deducting those expenses from the players' salaries. It's not great. Somebody said, hey, Dad, wake me up when it's over. Maybe this is not a con- – I, I don't know. This was a conversation that was wildly fascinating to me. No, this, this guy has a – but, but long it's not record to a lot of, of people. being woman. flipping. Oh, this woman is not for some reason listens every day and doesn't like us. It's the uh, it's the craziest doesn't like thing. Like you two, yeah. She likes me. Um, you can figure out why. No, I'm man, this, this affects a lot of. Well, look, this is a state that cares about college sports more than most because it's what we have, right? I mean, with all due respect to the Mississippi Braves and the Biloxi Shuckers, we don't have pro sports here. So something like this that's directly impacting our teams and in some cases our only hobby, it's important. And people are afraid it's going to change. I hear you. I don't think it will visually anyway, but 
I get why people are emotional about a few messages that were like, you know, wake me up when this conversation is over. But a couple of messages along these lines as well. This one from the coast. Today's college football discussion has been the best talking point on your show in a while. Uh, Chase and Columbus says when your teams are already at an inarguable disadvantage, as it is in recruiting, it's kind of relevant to have a discussion on the new rules that are on the table that can and likely will at this rate make the gap wider. Um, some of these others. I just don't think paying these kids ridiculously does them any good. You should have to work hard and earn money, but it is what it is. I'm fine with it. You don't think college football players work hard? That's that's a, that's a take. Um, I don't think that's the point that he's making at all. I think it's the players who have not proved anything at all in college who are being paid as inducements to come to a certain school that haven't earned anything that is kind of the point. That's not true, but once they, once they step on the practice field, they're working hard. Well, that's not atypical in society, right, for, for skilled-based things anyway. I mean, you have a, a band that will sign a record deal that got seen by a talent scout because they have those. What a dream job that would be, travel the country and discover bands. And they get signed to fat record deals before they produce anything. You have you have hundreds of sons of millionaires who get made executive vice presidents just because they graduated college with a 21 that make seven figures a year. Yeah. You don't have to work hard to make money. There is something to it, though. I mean, it, it, yeah, no, but those are the, those are exceptions, not rules, right? I mean, that's, so that's why the... is why isn't this an exception then? Why we're going to defend one but not the other? No, I, I'm I'm saying the not working hard and making money. That's not commonplace. Like that's what we we read about and we see. Like oh wow a bunch of money or they gave him a lot of money for not doing anything and that's all fun and good but that's not real life yeah but there's... you have to get up and go to work every day hey dad to get your paycheck right true and and you had to pay your dues to the point of getting a job where you, I, i'm not gonna speak for you i'll speak for me i didn't get to host this show because one day i woke up and was like you know what i want to host a sports talk radio show it was like 15 years in the in the making to get to the point where I could start legitimately down the path of being able to do this. I don't begrudge anybody who walks out of college and gets a job making a great salary. That's awesome. Yeah. Doesn't happen very often, though. But th th they're unique people. Some are. It, it, it's some are, but but it, it is different because they're not real life. That they're they're athletes. I mean, this fall, sixty thousand people are going to pack into Vaught Hemingway Stadium to watch Jackson Dart play or Luke Altmyer play, and all those guys on the field could be either one. We could don't be know either yet. One. I mean, millions of people watch Ole Miss and Mississippi State play on television. Millions of people. The athletic budgets there are $120 million. The, the SEC is going to cut each school a check moving forward for $50, 60000000 $1 million when the new TV contract comes in. They're not normal people. They don't, they, they're not treated like us. Because they, they have value. I mean, Jackson Dart and Luke Altmyer alone, Will Rogers has more value than I could dream of. They're, they're different. They uh, Unique people get unique privileges in life. Yes. Still got to work for it, though. You still got to earn it. Usually. I'm very, I'm so curious to see what's going to happen. I, I think we, we talked about this yesterday or the day before. What's going to happen when the guys that get the gaudy amounts of money don't perform? That's the next layer to this. Everybody talks about slippery slope. Oh, it's going to get worse. It might. But I'm telling you, if I was a multimillionaire business owner and I gave 500 k for this defensive end at Texas A&M and 500 k to that defensive end at Texas A&M and 500 k to that defensive end at Texas A&M, they're giving out a lot of money at Texas A&M. And one of those five guys that I bought turns out to be something and the rest bust? 
and they call me for another $2 million to give to next year's recruiting class? Maybe I'm such a diehard Aggie and I love my ring so much that I'll do it. But you don't get rich by giving away your money. That's, I think, the next layer to this that people aren't talking about is what's going to happen when this $8 million quarterback stinks when he goes to college because that's possible. In fact, it's likely. Michael's buddy on the C Spire text line says, this is the point I was making a year and a half ago. All jokes aside, this has gone from a slippery slope to a complete sheet of ice. There is no more slippery. It's sliding headfirst at a breakneck speed. And unfortunately, we will end up with collective bargaining in college football. And if we do, college football will survive. It'll just look different, and it'll feel different. Hopefully we'll see. telling you, man, it's, it's remarkable that the schools have not done something, have not got – and maybe they are. Maybe Greg Sankey's talking to the other ADs and saying, guys, we, we can't sustain – this is not sustainable. The fact that the NCAA could have seen what we, what we just talked about for the last hour – could have seen that coming for years because we've been talking about it for years. Mark Emmert makes, what, $3 million a year? There's eight other employees of the NCAA that make seven-figure salaries. The basketball tournament alone makes them $1 billion, and nobody there saw this coming. If they just tried with a modicum of competence we would not have had that conversation for the last hour. It wouldn't have gone like that. Yeah. Uh, This one from the 501. I guess that's an Arkansas number. Thanks for listening, whether you're in Arkansas or just from Arkansas. Just a perspective from a college graduate paying student loans. College athletes have so many perks being on scholarships, special dorms, tutors, personal cafeteria, guidance counselors, and so on. If you accept a job offer, then you agree to work for that company for an agreed amount of pay. Don't complain after you accept it that you aren't paid enough. Same with college athletics. If you accept a college scholarship, then you know that there will be extra work, but you do have a lot of perks that go along with it, not to mention free school. I I, I think on the surface that that's a really sound, that there, there's sound logic behind that. And in the world that most of us live in, it makes a lot of sense, right? You accept a job for a certain amount of money. You perform your duties. If the time comes where you are outperforming what you have been asked to do, then maybe it's appropriate to have a conversation about an increase in compensation. But if nothing changes, you just go to work and you do what you're supposed to do and your employer pays you as they're supposed to, then it should should kind of continue along those lines. But I would say the difference in this is exceptionalism and leverage. If you're just an employee who's just doing what they're supposed to do, and it would be really easy to go get somebody else to do exactly what you're doing, then you don't have a lot of leverage. But if you're elite at what you do and other people want you, then you've got leverage built in, and so you do have the ability to go, yeah, I'm I'm just going to go do something else. I know what we agreed to. And you see it happen all the time in the NFL and the NBA and other places, right? I mean, you'll have contract holdouts with NFL players demanding a new deal. But it's also different because there's a a finite shelf life there, right? Like you've only got so many money-making years, and you've got to try and maximize that. Um, Good text, though. What's going to happen, this is from Jason, when the big value guys can't perform because the other 10 guys on that team are over it being made clear that millions aren't watching them and they feel cheated? I don't know, man. I, I see, and it's different because they're all getting paid, but but I see that dynamic happen in pro sports, and it just it doesn't it, it does not disrupt things there at all. Uh, and so, you know, maybe college is different. Maybe they're not at a maturity level to handle it. But generally, if this guy next to me is making more than me, that means I need to step up my game and make more than him. And usually they're all really happy for each other when they get paid. Yeah. I mean, the guy that's making the league minimum in the NFL 
doesn't necessarily hate the guy that's making $20 million, might wish that he was making $20 million, but generally is thankful for the fact that he's on a team and he's making the league minimum. Yeah, use the Saints for an example. Marquez Callaway last year makes or made, what, 10, 12, I'm not a math guy, times fewer money than Michael Thomas. Michael Thomas didn't play a snap. Got paid $25 million last year. Callaway yeah. had to grind with bad quarterback play. Being the only competent receiver getting doubled all game made significantly less money, and I bet he loves Michael Thomas. And he's playing for his next contract. Yeah. He wants to get to the point where Michael Thomas is in terms of compensation. For whatever Chase, that's worth. Yeah, Chase says the sixth man – doesn't get LeBron money because he isn't LeBron. And he knows he isn't LeBron. That's a great point. But, but that's not unique, right? The, the, the lawyer that is an associate doesn't get paid the same way the partner does. Because he's not producing the way the partner is. Here's another or example. Uh, again, shout out Pelicans winning last night. Um they traded this offseason for Devontae Graham. I think he's making about $10 million a year to be the bat. Well, they started him at the time, but now when they signed C.J. McCollum, Devontae Graham was going to be the backup point guard at $10 million a year. Well, an undrafted rookie, Jose Alvarado, has taken all of his minutes. All of his minutes. He is the backup point guard for this team, plays more, scores more, everything. They signed him to a deal worth about $7 million over four years. So not only is he playing more and better than a guy, but they offered him a new contract, which is significantly less money, and they went out and had a party to celebrate. Just not something that's been an issue at the next level. Yeah. We get a message here. Some of these kids out of high school are driving a Pontiac Sunfire to school and haven't ever had anything, and there's another guy with a brand new car and money in the bank. That's true. It's absolutely true. And maybe that drives you to work harder, or maybe if you're not as good at football, because you were good enough to get a college scholarship, you were able to parlay that scholarship into a degree that sets you up for a job that gets you to the point where you don't have to have somebody give you a new car, or you can, you can go buy your own. Please don't for a second, because I'm, all three of us are absolutely on board with the idea that players deserve more. And I've sounded like a broken record with this. I've said it a hundred times. I just wish that we could all come to the agreement that they're not starting at zero. A scholarship has value. The meals have value. The, the place to stay has value. The insurance has value. The medical care has value. The, the sports-specific trainer and strength coach has value. Getting to wear the school's jersey and market yourself has value. The relationships you build have value. Being a college football player who doesn't make it to the NFL but graduates with a degree and you can say I was a college football player for X school has value when you go into the job market. There is value even for the college football player that doesn't make a lot of extra money through a name, image, and likeness deal. And, oh, by the way, and, and this, is, this, this is so lost in this deal. It's something we've talked about but probably don't talk about enough. If you are just a scholarship, full scholarship athlete at Ole Miss, for example, you're getting an extra twenty to twenty-five thousand dollars cash every single year through the opportunity fund, through the academic program that they've got in place, and through a cost of attendance stipend. That did not exist just three years ago. The college athlete that is playing in the SEC right now that is on a full scholarship, even if they're not getting extra money through NIL, is in a better place financially than any college athlete has ever been at any point in history. And that is a non-negotiable fact. Do they still deserve more? Maybe. 
And they've got the opportunity to go out and earn more or, or be given more. But at the base starting level, they are getting more than they have ever gotten at any point in history.